All right, let's uh, have our prophecy update as we do every Sunday. We look at the Middle East and Israel specifically. And as I'm sure you've been anticipating uh, for today's update, we will be looking at how this situation in Egypt uh, fits into end times Bible prophecy. Now, first, you should know that what we're about to see in the scriptures has blindsided many, myself especially, in that it happened very suddenly. See, the Bible prophecies concerning Egypt are thought by many as taking place during the seven-year tribulation. Uh, some even believe that the prophecies concerning Egypt will find their fulfillment in the millennium. So I have to sort of confess that this really took me by surprise as quickly as it came about as we're watching everything unfold. Now, let me hasten to say that much of what we'll look at today does find its ultimate fulfillment in and really at the end of the seven-year tribulation. But seeing it unfold now as it begins to happen seems to indicate that there's now an unstoppable momentum. Uh, when you see the news, and by the way, I should probably parenthetically say that I'm disappointed even in Fox News in that they have really uh, downplayed the role of the Muslim Brotherhood. We'll talk more about that in a moment, but uh, I was sadly uh, disappointed in their reporting on what's happening. But whenever you see a news channel put a map up on the screen, and you'll see uh, Yemen, you'll see Egypt, you'll see Jordan, you'll see Syria. And for those of you who are savvy when it comes to geography, you get the feeling that everything is surrounding Egypt. Now, you have to understand that uh, surrounding Israel, you have to understand that Egypt is paramount in its importance as it relates to Israel because Egypt, the largest of the Arab nations in the Middle East was the first to make a peace agreement under Anwar Sadat with Israel. Then, subsequently, Jordan followed. You've got Jordan on one side, you've got Egypt on the other side. I think it's the other way around, your left, my right. You've got Egypt and Jordan both on each side of Israel. And this is Islam. Let me say it again in a different way. What you are seeing now unfold in Egypt and in the Middle East is a move that has been planned for many years by Islam to submit by force, which, by the way, is what Islam means, submit using jihad, holy war, to get all of the Arab nations together in their sole goal of destroying Israel. And by the way, as we'll see in a moment, Iran's fingerprints are all over this. Iran is in this. Iran is on this. Please make no mistake about it. Now, when you see these prophecies that will ultimately find their fulfillment in the seven-year tribulation begin to happen now, then that begs the question of how close are we now? Again, Jesus in Luke 21, 28, I know a verse you're all familiar with. He said, when you see these things begin to come to pass, look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. Again, this completely blindsided me. I had just arrived at my hotel room in Spokane, of course, turn on the TV because it had been, you know, several hours without news, and I started shaking, and it was terrible. Not a pretty picture, but I, I got, had, had to know what's going on. I mean, we had heard rumblings about what was going on, of course, what was happening with Yemen, and then I turn on the TV, and sure enough, there it is in Cairo, all of these thousands upon thousands of protesters and the threat that comes packaged with it. 
Well, I believe that we are very close to seeing the return of the Lord in what the Bible calls the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. And I don't say that arbitrarily. I say that with the more sure word of prophecy, meaning that what we see in the word is God's word telling us, I don't want you to be ignorant about what's happening or going to happen in the last days. I want you to be ready. And that's why the Bible is not silent as it relates to end times prophecy. Well, let's go ahead and jump into God's word and let's see what the Bible says about Egypt in the last days. And for that, I'll have you turn to the Old Testament book of Isaiah, the 19th chapter. Now, in the interest of time, we're going to do an overview of the prophecy in this chapter, but in so doing, we should be able to unveil what I'll call six specifics, kind of got a little ring to it, six specifics concerning Egypt. Now, I should preface this by saying this, uh, this, what we're about to see in Isaiah 19, sure looks an awful lot like what we're seeing on our television screens as it relates to Egypt, the prophecies concerning Egypt. So let's look at the first one. It's found in Isaiah 19, verses 1 and 2. Egypt will experience an uprising in the form of a civil war. Now listen to what the prophet Isaiah says, verse 1, an oracle concerning Egypt. See, the Lord rides on a swift cloud and is coming to Egypt. The idols of Egypt tremble before him, and the hearts of the Egyptians melt within them. I will, verse 2, stir up Egyptian against Egyptian. Brother will fight against brother, neighbor against neighbor, city against city, kingdom against kingdom. I believe that we are witnessing exactly this. In fact, so much so what we're hearing on the news is that these are Egyptians rising up against Egyptians. They are Muslim brothers rising up against Muslim brothers and neighbors against neighbors. And now it's not just Cairo. You're seeing now protesters in Alexandria. Now, I happen to have family in Egypt, again, on my dad's side. Uh, we have an aunt who lives in Giza, which is close to where the pyramids are. Actually, she lives about five minutes uh, from the pyramids. When we were there, we stayed with her. Uh, but she would also uh, drive us into uh, Cairo, which depending on traffic, you know, maybe 45 minutes to an hour, and away, uh, an hour away. But I also have family in uh, Alexandria, which was my father's birthplace. And that's about two and a half hours away. And what you're finding now, what you're seeing now, is that Alexandria and Cairo, the, the biggest of the two uh, cities in uh, Egypt now, are rising up uh, against each other. I thought it was interesting late last week when all of a sudden the pro mobotic protesters went to the streets. Some accused Mobotic's uh, government of paying them to protest on his behalf. And that's when it got really ugly. So now you're seeing this civil war rise up within Egypt, brother against brother, and city against city. The second one in verses 3 and 4. Egypt will be ruled over by a powerful and cruel master. Now verse 3, the prophet Isaiah writes, The Egyptians will lose heart, and I will bring their plans to nothing. They will consult the idols and the spirits of the dead, the mediums and the spiritists. I will hand the Egyptians over to the power of a cruel master, and a fierce king will rule over them, declares the Lord Almighty. Now, this would seem to indicate that Egypt will come under the control and the rule of the Antichrist. This for a number of reasons, not the least of which is what we have recorded in Daniel's prophecy, the 11th chapter. Let me just read verses 42 and 43. 
He, speaking of the Antichrist, shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and watch this, the land of Egypt shall not escape. But, verse 43, he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver and over all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. So this would seem to fit with the prophecy that we have in Daniel, which describes Egypt as not escaping the control and the rule, the cruel rule of the Antichrist. Let's look at the third one. It's in verses 5 through 10. We're told that Egypt will become even more impoverished. Verse 5, the waters of the river will dry up and the riverbed will be parched and dry. The canals will stink. The streams of Egypt will dwindle and dry up. The reeds and rushes will wither. Also the plants along the Nile at the mouth of the river. Even every sown field along the Nile will become parched, will blow away and be no more. The fishermen will groan and lament all who cast hooks into the Nile. Those who throw nets on the water will pine away. Those who work with combed flax will despair. The weavers of fine linen will lose hope. The workers in cloth will be dejected, and all wage earners will be sick at heart. This is really hard, especially if you're familiar with what Egypt is like. Uh, it was interesting when my wife and I were there, we missed our train to get from Cairo to Alexandria, which I had no idea at the time was a terrible, terrible thing because we were forced to take a cab. Now, I just want to tell you that if you ever find yourself in Egypt, don't ever take a cab in Egypt, okay? We had to take a cab, and the cab driver, I was convinced, was the Antichrist, actually, and I was also convinced that we were going to see Jesus Christ because I was sure we were not going to make it. Uh, my wife and I, we had the windows down, no AC. Uh, we're dying. Uh, it's so dirty, and it's so smelly. There were times we would drive along the Nile as it had dried up. This is 13 years ago, 1997, 14 years ago almost. And I'll never forget the stench that we smelled. This is, you know, on the way to uh, Cairo. We got to the hotel in Alexandria. First of all, we were kissing the ground. Thank you, Jesus, we made it. But we had, our face was caked with dirt. We, we took off our glasses. The only thing that was clean were the circles around our eyes. We get to the hotel, and I'm in a conversation with one of the guys at the hotel who was uh, tending to a wedding reception that was being held at this hotel. And uh, in Arabic, I was having this dialogue with him because I was kind of curious to see a, you know, I hadn't been to a Arab wedding in a while, especially one in my homeland of Egypt. And by the way, uh, that's a, you haven't lived until you've been to an Arab wedding in the Middle East. I mean, it's a celebration. And they do that, by the way, and ear piercing too, by the way. But I was talking with him and I was kind of curious, and I don't know how we got on the subject, but he began to tell me that, this is 13 years ago, the average wage in Egypt is 30 U.S. dollars a month. Physicians, and I know we have some physicians in the church, do you know what your pay would be if you were a physician in Egypt? About 100, maybe 150 U.S. dollars per month. It is absolute abject poverty. So when the prophet Isaiah says it's even going to get worse, that's hard to get your mind around. Let's look at the fourth one, verses 11 through 15. Egypt will be led astray by corruption and deception. Now, this is what I think we're seeing playing out even now. Verse 11, the officials of Zoan are nothing but fools. The wise counselors of Pharaoh give senseless advice. How can you say to Pharaoh, 
I am one of the wise men, a disciple of the ancient kings. Where are your wise men now? Let me show you and make known what the Lord Almighty has planned against Egypt. The officials of Zoan <coughs> pardon me, have become fools. The leaders of Memphis are deceived. The cornerstones of her peoples have led Egypt astray. The Lord has poured into them a spirit of dizziness. They make Egypt stagger in all that she does as a drunken staggers around in his vomit. Pretty graphic. Verse 15, there is nothing Egypt can do, head or tail, palm branch or reed. See, I believe that right now, Egypt, under the banner of being freed from the Mobotic dictatorship, will be enslaved under Sharia law when the leadership of the Muslim Brotherhood comes in. Now let me just uh, say quickly about the Muslim Brotherhood. They have done an unspeakably successful job of convincing the whole world, except Israel, and Bible discerning Christians that they're not behind what's going on here. I think almost to a reporter, they're spreading this propaganda. You know, one thing that when my dad was alive, he always used to tell me, he said, you know, Wahid, when you see all of this start to happen, you have to know that the Arabs, particularly when you get into Egypt, they are the experts when it comes to propaganda. See, the, the propaganda that we're hearing is that, no, these are, you know, they're different, you know, groups of Egyptians are represented. And Mubarak is a dictator, and we need, you know, freedom. We need fair elections, and Mubarak needs to step down now. This is all the Muslim Brotherhood, by design, entering into Egypt, and the first thing on the chopping block will be the peace agreement that Israel has with Egypt. And this will bring about a, an unspeakable corruption and deception, and Egypt will come under the rule of this fierce leader. By the way, pictured here, notice this El Baradeh, this uh, opposition leader, as he's called. And again, some of the news agencies here in the U.S. have really painted this guy in a very favorable light. I'll talk more about him in just a moment, but suffice it to say for the moment, this dude is not our friend. This is a bad dude, and I'll tell you why in a moment. Here's the fifth one. It's in verses 16 through 17. In that day... The Egyptians will be like women. They will shudder with fear at the uplifted hand that the Lord Almighty raises against them. And verse 17, the land of Judah will bring terror to the Egyptians. Everyone to whom Judah is mentioned will be terrified because of what the Lord Almighty is planning against them. See, we had Nasser before Sadat, both of whom tried to attack Israel, one of which tried to attack them on Yom Kippur, the holy day of the Jews. And they were soundly defeated. And in fear, Anwar Sadat made a peace agreement with Israel. You have to understand that the entire Middle East lives in fear of Israel. Why? Because of the God of Israel who comes to the aid of his people. And will still, by the way, when no other nation on earth is standing with her, especially not the United States of America. Listen, I don't mean to rain on anybody's parade, but you have to understand that when this administration gets on our television sets and they say something to the effect of Mubarak needs to step down now, they are slapping Israel in the face, and they, we, will not get away with that. Oh, my goodness. Pastor, you're really bumming me out. 
You know, praise God, it's a gift. Have a nice afternoon on Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> Listen, Genesis 12, 2 and 3 is still in my Bible, and I know it's still in yours. Any nation who curses Israel will be cursed, and any nation who blesses Israel will be blessed. You know that we're living in the residual blessing here in the United States of America of our blessing to Israel? You know that that is fast going away? Why? Because so too is our support of Israel fast going away. I'm just praying the rapture comes before we, uh, you know, cut everything off from uh, Israel. Uh, Dan Gilderman, the former U, uh, UN ambassador for Israel, will come on Fox News every once in a while. I like this guy. He's, um, you know, he's not a, a, a believer, but he is a, a Jew and a very intelligent, just unspeakable intelligence and very articulate. And I mean, he just says it like it is. And uh, he, he makes it very clear that absent Mubarak, you've got the Muslim Brotherhood and you've got now another enemy against Israel. Here's the last one. It's found in verses 18 through 25. This is where it gets good. Egypt will be delivered from the Antichrist and convert to the God of Israel. Now, this is where we see and why we see that this prophecy concerning Israel or Egypt in Isaiah 19 finds its ultimate fulfillment in and at the end of the seven-year tribulation, and even, some believe, spilling into the 1,000-year reign. Uh, we call it the millennium. Now, verse 18, Isaiah writes, In that day, five cities in Egypt will speak the language of Canaan and swear allegiance to the Lord Almighty. One of them will be called the city of destruction. In that day, there will be an altar to the Lord in the heart of Egypt and a monument to the Lord at its border. It will be a sign and witness to the Lord Almighty in the land of Egypt. When they cry out to the Lord because of their oppressors, he will send them a savior and defender, and he will rescue them. So the Lord, verse 21, will make himself known to the Egyptians, and in that day they will acknowledge the Lord. They will worship with sacrifices and grain offerings. They will make vows to the Lord and keep them. The Lord will strike Egypt with a plague. He will strike them and heal them. They will turn to the Lord, and he will respond to their pleas and heal them. In that day, here it is again, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. The Assyrians will go to Egypt and the Egyptians to Assyria. The Egyptians and Assyrians will worship together. In that day, Israel will be the third, along with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing on the earth. The Lord Almighty will bless them, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, Assyria, my handiwork, and Israel, my inheritance. I tell you, that brings me great joy to my heart, being an Arab. Um, when I was in Spokane, we were talking about this, and I had one uh, family member that was voicing his uh, anger towards Muslims. And I just had the presence of mind and, and the prompting of the Holy Spirit to say, God loves Muslims, and God has a plan for the Muslim people, even now, in advance of this. We are seeing, by the multitudes, Muslims coming to Christ in, of all places, places like Iran, Iraq, all over the Middle East. Jesus himself is appearing to them in dreams, and when they wake up, they renounce Allah and his prophet Muhammad, and they accept the true and living God, Jesus the Christ, and they go underground. And I'll tell you, the churches there could teach the church here a thing or two. I don't mean that to be derogatory. I'm surely not wanting to, you know, beat us up or heap condemnation on us. But I think that it's exciting what's happening in the Middle East even now. The bottom line is God has a plan for the Arab people, my people. Well, let's uh, bring it in for a landing. By the way, here's a picture of Muhammad El Baradeh with none other than Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Uh, Ahmed, 
Din Jihad uh, is his, uh, also his other name. That's what Joel Rosenberg calls him, which I think is quite appropriate. Um, but listen, this guy, this Al Baradei, was the uh, former UN inspector who went into Iran and came back with the report, oh, they don't have any nuclear weapons. Really? And then subsequent to him, the ones who went in said, excuse me, uh, he's deceived you. This is a very deceptive man, and he is very chummy with one Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. And again, maybe in the week or weeks that follow, we'll look more closely at this, but again, make no mistake about it. Iran is in this. Iran is on this. They are very excited about what they see happening there. What does the future hold? We don't know. We know who holds the future. And in light of the future, we need to keep our eye on the Middle East, namely Egypt, Iran, Syria, and especially up and coming, and we'll talk more about this, Lord willing, the nation of Turkey. They play a very pronounced role. You have to understand that Turkey was the center, the Mecca of Islam as it was Christianity. You know the seven churches in the book of Revelation? You know where those seven churches were planted? In the uh, ancient uh, area known in the Bible as Asia Minor, we know it as uh, Turkey. Constantinople, the capital Istanbul. We'll, we'll talk more about Turkey. Very interesting. And of course, they're very uh, pronounced. Um, there's one more thing I wanted to say, and I, I think the antihistamine has uh, <laughs> kicked in. By the way, if I start falling asleep during my teaching, you'll, <laughs> you'll forgive me. Somebody just kindly and graciously wake me up. I'm sure it'll come back to me during the Super Bowl this afternoon, so I'll just have to send you an email if it does. The reason that we need to watch these nations is because it becomes a sign to us that Jesus Christ, our Lord, is coming quickly for us. Last but certainly not least, I think I'd be grossly remiss were I not to talk briefly about the Christian brothers and sisters in Egypt amongst the most persecuted in all of the world. There's a, a mission uh, organization called Missions International. I had the privilege of meeting the founder of this organization when I was at the Calvary Chapel Senior Pastors Conference a couple years ago in Murrieta, California. And I'm on their list, and they keep me kind of posted on what's going on over there. I want to just read an excerpt from one of their emails. He says, Our church located on the outlying area of the capital of Cairo canceled all their services and activities over this past weekend. Pastor H, of course, they can't give the name because he'll be, of course, beheaded, uh, reports that everyone in the church is safe, and he has requested that they all remain in their homes during these mass protests. The church and Christians in Egypt desperately need our prayers during this time. Uh, the other organization, one I'm sure you're all familiar with, is Franklin Graham's Samaritan's Purse. Let me just read his uh, recent posting. This is a critical time of unrest and uncertainty, and Christians need to join together in prayer for this volatile region. Please join with us in praying for the Christian minorities who could face increasing persecution in the days ahead. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Pray that God will use these current crises to open doors and hearts to the gospel and that many will find peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, Romans 5.1. Ultimately, we know true peace will come to this region only when Christ returns in power and glory. So you know what? Let's do that. Let's pray. Loving Father in heaven, we're coming to you very humbly and very simply, really as a child, with our childlike faith, only the size of a mustard seed, believing that it can move mountains. Lord, would you hear from on high and move your mighty hand on behalf of of our brothers and sisters in Egypt. Lord, would you encamp around about them with your heavenly host and protect them from the evil 
protect them from the persecution that is coming their way. Lord, will you strengthen them? Will you increase them numerically? Lord, will you encourage their hearts? Lord, may their light in this darkness shine ever so brightly. And may, Lord, many more come to you because of this, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.